Hello and welcome everyone to our talk. It's really cool to see a fully packed room. Um, today's talk is about better bandwidth management with eBPF. I'm Daniel Brockman. I, am, I co maintain eBPF in the Linux kernel and I uh, work with the Cilium team. And the talk is together with Christopher and Nikolai, who are also from the Cilium team. Uh, before we look into bandwidth management, I wanted to start out with an interesting metric which you can see here on the right side. The metric is basically the density, like the number of uh, pods per node. And what you can see here, like the more people use Kubernetes, the, the higher the density gets. So for example, uh, it's probably reasonable to assume in uh, 2022 that there, is a, that, that there is a median of around 50 pods per node. And with that increasing density, it also means that there's a competition for resources on a given node for example, CPU and memory. So basically operators have the, uh, have the issue that they need to tackle uh, how to allocate and efficiently use resources. Um, one uh, tool that you can use in the pod spec, for example, is that you can uh, define resources, uh, requests, and limits. For example, resource requests, uh, they define how much uh, CPU and memory a given pod uh, requires. And then Kubelet will make sure that uh, that pod is scheduled in a node which can actually satisfy that uh, constraint. Uh, limits, for example, if a pod overshoots its memory usage, it will get OM killed. So now the question is, what about networking? So TCP in its nature sends as fast as possible. What you can see here on the right picture is a typical um, uh, TCP con uh, congestion control uh, algorithm that will try to um, send uh, more TCP segments to the network. And so there's an exponential growth fast in the beginning until it, ex it experiences a packet loss and then it will back down and then it will try to do the same thing again. So really the output contract for TCP is to send as fast as possible. Uh, and shaping uh, is typically done by device output queues. So basically the queue limit for those output queues as well as the remotes uh, receive window size uh, determine how many packets from TCP can be in flight. And, but who actually limits a pod's network usage in Kubernetes? So there's a infrastructure for that in Kubernetes. So there's a bandwidth enforcement. So far, this has only been experimental, unfortunately. So if you look into the pod spec, there are Kubernetes-specific uh, annotations. So you have an uh, ingress annotation, you have an egress annotation, then you can, for example, set something like a pod should get an egress bandwidth of 50 megabits per second. And support for that pod annotation so far has only been implemented with the bandwidth meta plugin. That's a plugin from the CNI plugin collection. And that basically implements a, a, a basic token bucket filter from the Linux uh, traffic control subsystem. So how does it look? Um, uh, for example, if you have a typical node that you can see here, there's a pod in the node, and the pod is typically connected to the host namespace with two weave devices, one lag in the host namespace, one lag of the weave, of the weave device in the pod namespace, and token bucket filter QDIS are attached there. But the real problem is it's not scalable for production use, and I will show you why. If you, for example, set an ingress bandwidth rate of 50 megabits per second uh, in your pod spec, then basically that bandwidth meta plugin will then attach a token bucket filter QDisk to the weave device in the host namespace. Uh, that is attached from the TC subsystem in Linux on the egress side, but if you look at the logical traffic flow point of view, it's uh, like ingressing into the pod, the traffic. So if, if, if there are many clients connecting from the internet um, to that part, for example, uh, they will all hit uh, that token bucket filter QDisk. And it has actual uh, design issues because uh, the token bucket filter QDisk, it's, uh, given it has to track its state uh, in terms of the shaping, it, there's basically a single log that has to be taken across um, all CPUs. And that's a huge contention point if you want to uh, if, if you receive traffic from multiple CPUs at the same time. And that basically completely defeats uh, multi-queue 
uh, capability of physical NICs, because typically a, a NIC has many receive queues. Uh, then once packet arrive on the different receive queues, CPUs will pick that up in parallel. They will process it. They will forward it in parallel. But then they will all hit that single token bucket filter queue disk. The other issue with that is also that queuing on the receive side is actually a no-go because it, it consumes resources. It, the, the packet basically made it over the wire. It consumed your network and then only to receive it on the node itself where it then goes into that queue disk. It's waiting in that queue instead of being processed and only then to be dropped, for example. So that really causes buffer bloat for your network. If you look at the other direction, uh, for example, if you install an egress bandwidth of 50 megabit per second, then that uh, bandwidth meta plugin will basically uh, set up an additional device. It's called an IFB device type. And then all the traffic from the host weave device will be redirected to that IFB device. And on that IFB device, there's the token bucket filter QDisk installed with the given rate. Why is that workaround, uh, you might ask? But the, the issue is. Uh, Logically, that traffic in the host namespace, when it egresses the pod, it arrives in the traffic control subsystem in the Linux kernel on the ingress side. And on the ingress side, the Linux kernel cannot shape. So you need to redirect it to a different device, only that you're at the TC egress layer. And only there you can attach the token bucket filter QDisk. So if you have multiple applications in your pod, they can send traffic from multiple CPUs, and they will all hit that same token bucket filter QDisk. That also has uh, design issues because now you're, now you're actually queuing twice. You're queuing on the weave device, like on the IFB device, but then also you're queuing on the physical device because there's typically also a QDisk attached that is handling all your outgoing traffic. Uh, for example, on Linux by default, that's FQCardle. So that really causes buffer bloat, which is a big issue. Then again, you have the single lock contention point across all the CPUs, so you cannot actually make it scalable across CPUs. And then there's also a mechanism in the TCP stack, which is called TCP small queues. TCP small queues is there to reduce buffer bloat, so that you reduce excessive buffering in queues. And TCP small queues basically works, that works the way that uh, TCP stack tries to not send too much packets. But now those packets are stuck in queues. And when, like once they are processed there, they go to the upper stack. And it will basically fool the TCP stack that the packet might, might already be on the wire, even though it's still on your host. And, and last but not least, you now you need three uh, net devices instead of just two. So overall, I would say it's a latency killer. Uh, because you have uh, you have to deal so much with queuing, it doesn't scale across CPUs, and yeah, it's not uh, really ready for production use. The other thing is like the nature of TCP. When you send as fast as possible, and um, what you can see when you look at the queuing theory, well, like so, once you get to the point where you uh, consume the bottleneck link close to 100%, what you can see here in that graph is that the that the wait time of packets in the queue they basically skyrocket to infinite. So there has been some interesting research from, uh, from Google folks, and they were asking themselves, so can we get rid of queues entirely? So they came up with a really cool idea, which is uh, called the earliest departure time model. So they basically said, we, let's, let's, replace, let's replace, uh, queuing fully and come up with two simple core pieces. One is the earliest uh, departure time. So it's basically a timestamp on the network packet in the host, which will dictate the, the time when the packet can be delivered to the network at the earliest possible point in time. And the other one is a timing wheel scheduler, which will basically hold this constraint and then uh, send packets out. So how can this model be applied to, uh, to Kubernetes? So enter eBPF. So you've probably heard eBPF many times at this conference. So it's basically a way to make the kernel programmable. You have a small uh, uh, programs that get verified for safety and they can be attached to different points in the Linux kernel. And um, Cilium is an eBPF-based uh, CNI, or you can better call it like networking platform because it does many things. So it does, uh, takes care of pod connectivity, but also service load balancing, network policies, and so on and so forth. I don't want to go too much into details. The one detail I want to go into is the bandwidth management. So we implemented the Cilium Bandwidth Manager, and that Bandwidth Manager basically allows for lockless, uh, earliest departure time-based uh, part rate limiting with eBPF. So basically what you can see here, 
the, the enforcement point, we moved from the Weave device to the physical device so that you don't need uh, to queue twice. You can avoid this additional buffer bloat if you uh, have it on the physical device. And you also don't need the upper stack. So we have a mode in uh, Cilium which is called BPF host routing where all the routing can remain in the TC eBPF layer and it can be forwarded there directly to the physical device. And you can use certain functionality of the networking stack, such as, for example, the FIP lookup. You can just reuse them out of BPF itself. And the good thing with that is um, that it will keep uh, the TCP small queue feedback properly. So how does the architecture look like of the bandwidth manager? If you set a pod, uh, uh, specification that it can, for example, uh, send 50 megabit or so, then in the end, like the packet arrives at the physical device, there's an eBPF program attached to it uh, that was uh, orchestrated by Cilium. It is taking care of the packet departure timestamps, and Cilium also sets up a multi queue queue disk with uh, so called fair queue leaf queue disks on the device, and those uh, fair queue leaf queue disks, they basically implement this timing wheel scheduler that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> if you look at the performance of this uh, architecture compared to the token bucket filter approach, it's really interesting because um, we, we, we run an experiment with multiple concurrent flows in parallel, uh, in this case 256. And those flows, they are basically ping pong flows. So it, it will send uh, one byte of data to one direction and one byte back to the other direction. We do that because we want to stress like the, the latency. We want to see the latency of the, of the whole system. And each of those concurrent flows has a rate limit of 100 uh, megabit per second. So now what you can see here is the time in microseconds. So the yellow uh, bar here is basically the token bucket filter approach and the green one is the earliest departure time model that we implemented with Cilium. So when you look at the median, um, it's um, around seven times lower latency than the uh, tra uh, traditional approach which is based on queuing. And even if you look at the P99 latency, you get over uh, 4x better latency. And if you look at the actual transaction rate, so when you run NetPerf, one transaction is basically uh, like, a, like a ping pong, so one uh, byte of data in one direction and then the other direction, um, you get over seven times better transaction rate under this 100 megabit per second constraint. <clears throat> All right, so, so far we have seen how we can implement scalable bandwidth management uh, with Cilium uh, based on the earliest departure time model. But what about thinking even more broadly? Can we do like even for the, for the internet band, uh, better bandwidth management? So what else does the earliest departure time model enable? It enables BBR. So BBR is a TCP congestion control algorithm that has been developed by uh, folks from Google Research. And the internet um, today is basically is basically what you can see on the on the left side of the picture. So you have a loss-based uh, uh, TCP congestion control algorithm. So if you don't change any defaults on your Linux laptop or server, for example, you will have that model on the left side. It's uh, the so-called TCP cubic congestion control algorithm. So as I mentioned earlier, it tries to ramp up its congestion window until, it's, until uh, it experiences congestion loss somewhere, and then it tries to back down. So you see the sawtooth pattern for a connection. On the right side, you have the BBR. So BBR is modeled in a different way. So it's basically modeled around the delivery uh, rate that uh, the, the traffic can be delivered to the, to the receiver, as well as the uh, round trip time. So it's not based on packet loss, basically. So when would it be useful to consider BBR? So if you have a Kubernetes cluster where your clients connect from outside of the internet, uh, then it uh, would be um, really useful to look into that uh, because it will Im uh, significantly improve your latency uh, for low-end last mile networks because typically buffer bloat happens on your, on your home routers and it will improve there. But it will also significantly improve the throughput for, for high-speed networks um, when you have... Uh, like a, like a long delay in this case. So I, I run an example, for example, I uh, 
reserved the server in New York from, from the packet.net and I tried to do an iperf measurement to our lab in Zurich that we have. And what you can see here with the default, so default is TCP cubic and FQ Caudal uh, as a QDisk. What you can see here when you look at the bit rate, it's trying, it's slowly trying to ramp up until it reaches a point where it gets to 400 something megabit per second, but then it experienced loss somewhere on the path. And at that point, it's, you know, like it's uh, slowing down again and it's trying the same thing until it reaches 400 something megabits. So overall, the average bit rate is 270 megabit per second. And now if you switch over to BBR for this experiment, um, you will see that it will ramp up until, until 400 megabit per second and it will plateau at that point in time. So just by changing that congestion control algorithm for connections over the internet, you can reach from 270 megabit per second to over 400. So now the question is, can BBR actually be used with Kubernetes pods? Um, so BBR works in conjunction with the, with, with the FQ QDisk, which implements this timing wheel. So you really need a timestamp for your packets. But the problem is, when you have network namespaces, then the kernel actually clears the timestamp when the packet goes from one weave device to another. So in that case, BBR can actually not work because uh, it, it will get an instable rate because the timestamps are zeroed. So why is that? It's because of a kernel limitation. So in the kernel, we have a packet representation, which is called the socket buffer. And the socket buffer holds all possible metadata around the packet, including a timestamp. And um, the timestamp has, uh, like for the receive side and for the transmit side, it has a different clock base. For example, for the receive side, it has the so-called clock TAI. It's, a, it's an atomic clock. And for traffic that is going out from the transmit side, it has a clock base of clock monotonic. And the problem is, the socket buffer it try, it's like the most critical data structure in the Linux kernel networking stack because you, you have to keep it as small as possible just to avoid cache misses, just to keep your performance high. So there's just a single 64-bit uh, timestamp field in the kernel and um, that is why it had to be cleared. And the problem is, um, People tried in the past to standardize just on clock TAI, um, but it didn't work because the, it's like the TAI clock when you um, is typically taken from like from, like somewhere from the hardware. For example, if you have a hardware clock, and it will uh, take over that the timestamp into the packet. But if there are some if there's buggy hardware or if you have some clock skews, it will basically uh, mess around with the timestamp too much. And for example, if you get a too high offset for your timestamp, then it will cause a drop in the fair queue queue disk because it will uh, go over a certain horizon and that will break TCP. So it has been tried in the past to just standardize on a single clock, but it had to be reverted. And then when you forward from receive to transmit, that's the limitation where people had to clear the timestamp back to zero. And just as a note, like this monotonic clock is not uh, prone to such a uh, clock skews. So yeah, that's the reason why it couldn't work. And we have uh, worked together with uh, guys from uh, Facebook to fix that problem in the Linux kernel. So we presented the issue, uh, I think it was at the last year's Linux Plumbers conference, and they run in the end into the exactly the same. And so we fixed this together. And now the timestamp is actually retained for, for like the outgoing timestamp for sockets that are, in a, uh, that are in pods. So when packets traverse the network namespaces, it will be retained on then all the way until the physical device. So now with the bandwidth manager that we implemented in Cilium with the, with the whole architecture, what basically happens is uh, you can do all the routing in the TC uh, BPF layer, the timestamp will be retained and also the socket association to the packet, which is needed for the TCP stack to get the proper feedback. And then on the physical device, there's this multi-queue with the fair queue leaf queue disks to implement this timing wheel and then it can basically work. Just as a side note, uh, BBR, you actually only need to, to enable this on the server side because uh, so you don't, it's not necessary to have it on the client side because typically all the bulk traffic comes, goes from the server to the client. 
So now to our demo. So in our demo, we are basically want to show you um, a streaming service that we implemented, like a mini uh, Netflix in that sense. <laughs> and we want to compare it uh, for Cubic and BBR under different network conditions. This is basically how our setup works, uh, how, how our setup looks like. So we have a mini cluster. That mini cluster uh, has one node. On that node, there are two pods. Um, and yeah, there's an FFmpeg pod which basically ingests a video and it uh, chunks it up into smaller pieces. And the engine X pod is basically the, the front end uh, which serves those uh, video chunks to a client. And it is basically behind the Kubernetes service that we expose to the internet. And last but not least, we have an external client. It can be somebody with a phone, it can be with a laptop, or just a regular workstation. It connects to that Kubernetes server that we have uh, over the internet. And we, we emulate uh, latency, and then also later on latency and drop, um, with the help of a so-called NetMQ disk. So NetMQ disk in Linux uh, traffic control subsystem is, is explicitly there to simulate bad network conditions. And yeah, so we want to show this under two different configurations. So one is the bandwidth manager with the cubic TCP congestion control algorithm, and the other one is the feature that we implemented uh, now with the BBR. And with that, I'm switching over to Christopher. Hello. So what we have here is two clusters. We try to make them as similar as possible. They're both running in Madrid in the same data center. The only difference between them is one is enabled with uh, Cubic, the standard configuration, and the other is enabled with uh, BBR. And so what we do is we, we scrape in and we see two different videos, okay? We got really excited when uh, we had like a lot of latency problems just walking around. Uh, I'm personally data capped on my smartphone, so I can't watch a lot of videos, or else they're constantly buffering. So what we have here is uh, one of our colleagues in Ponchasina is you know, doing a little bit of sky uh, surfing here. And on the left side here, we have our cluster with uh, Cubic set up. And what we see is that Cubic is constantly sitting inside of a low resolution, and we're loading uh, everything However, we did introduce a little bit of latency. So what we're doing is we're introducing packet loss, like every 1% of packets are being dropped, as well as we're introducing our own, um, like 100 milliseconds or more of latency. And we're able to do a sustain in the right-hand side with BBR, much higher resolution, even under distress. So both have exactly the same amount of uh, injected latency being injected into them. But what you see on the left side, if you open up your Chrome tools, is that even at 100 milliseconds, we're not able to pull down the high resolution ever with uh, Cubic. On the right side, same uh, amount of latency. We always get HD quality, and we pull that down with the same amount of latency. And so the important piece here is that uh, you will sometimes still, uh, you know, there's obviously congestion, there's packets being lost, but the important part is when VBR hits this, it, it'll hit the limit, it maybe goes fuzzy for a bit, but then it keeps right back up at it, and it'll hit the HE limit. Under sustained latency, Cubic will never cross over into the HD range at this sustained latency, and, you know, it'll, it'll often have a lot more rebuffering. And we can also look into uh, a few of the statistics using the SS utility. So what we see here in Cubic is our congestion window being set a little higher, um, but it, it will, it will uh, kind of sustain around seven or so segments that it's able to send during that window. Whereas if we were to do the same thing over in our BBR cluster, we'll get a much higher cap that will be sustainable over time. <laughs> 
So in here we're operating at around 416, so much, much higher than what we were able to send before. I should uh, mention that the, the guy in the video was our colleague, uh, Tom. So he was uh, flying in his paraglider at uh, one of our uh, on-site events when we went skiing. <laughs> All right. So now the question is, uh, you know, is BBR the golden solution? Well, uh, BBR has potential uh, unfairness issues. So, for example, if you use it in uh, combination with uh, with Cubic, so if some nodes are in Cubic and you know in, in your cluster, some others on BBR. Um, BBR is uh, pretty aggressive, so it could uh, uh, overrun basically Cubic. Um, you will see a higher rate of retransmissions on TCP. Simply, it's trying to more aggressively probe. Uh, the Google uh, research folks they are working on BBR v2 um, in order to overcome those limitations. Uh, I just want to call out: there's an interesting talk from the NetDev conference, which uh, from a, from someone from Dropbox, where they deployed uh, BBR on the edge and also BBR v2. So they did some early measurements. What you can see here, like on the green side, is like this. There's like a 3% TCP retransmission rate on the BBR v1, whereas the v2 stays around 1%. So um, it is trying to overcome those issues. But on the other hand, BBR has been deployed in production on a large number of, of uh, fleets. So it is definitely uh, something interesting to consider. Um, yeah, so coming back to the earlier uh, problem statement that we have, like how can you uh, make sure that uh, pods can be rate limited? Uh, so the bandwidth enforcement from Kubernetes really doesn't have to remain in a poor state. Um, so with the Cilium bandwidth manager implementation, uh, it, it will be GA with the next Cilium release, which will go out uh, shortly after KubeCon. It basically implements efficient and, efficient and scalable eBPF-based enforcement with the help of the earliest departure time model. And with the work that we did around uh, BBR uh, and to retain the uh, timestamps across the network namespace uh, when packets uh, traverse them, uh, it's, we, we are basically like the first CNI to support BBR uh, that you can use and, and deploy your pods with. And as a side note, um, I should mention that um, Realizing this whole architecture around the bandwidth manager is uh, possible thanks to eBPF, simply because with eBPF you can do flexible uh, traffic classification and also set the packet delivery timestamp. If you want to try out the bandwidth manager, there's a getting started guide that we have in our Cilium documentation. Um, the bandwidth manager itself, if you want to use the EDT-based uh, rate limiting for parts, it needs the kernel 5.1. The support for BBR is a, bit, is a little bit newer because we uh, got that merged around December in the Linux kernel, so it requires 5.18. Um, with that, I would love to thank a couple of folks, especially from uh, Google, Facebook, and from our team, and the uh, Cilium BPF and NetDev kernel community. And yeah, so that's it for the talk. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. Yes. Not sure who will give you the mic. Otherwise, uh, please shout or I will. <laughs> All right. So, in the case that the available bandwidth is such a dynamic code server and has more bandwidth, like we use all the time, the cube compiler is going to supply it to be able to adapt to that increase in bandwidth. Is this the same as well for the EDP approach? Yes. Uh, so I should repeat the question. Um, the question is if there is uh, like a lot of bandwidth available and Cubic is trying to ramp up quickly, is this the same with BBR, right? Um, yes, it is. It will just, uh, ha it, it just has a different uh, delivery model around it and it's not prone to packet loss, but it will see when it, uh, it will see the delivery rate based on the measurements and it will plateau at that point, so yes. <laughs> 
also if there's an increase in available bandwidth, yes, exactly. They, they, they will both have the, the slow start ramp up. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so the question is, if you have a load balancer in the middle, do you also have to set up BBR in the load balancer? No, you don't. So you only have to set up, you only have to set it up on the server side, so on your back ends, because it's actually transparent. So it, it, you really need to have it on the socket, and that's on the back end in the application. Yeah, exactly. Because the packet is basically load balance based on L4 layer. It, you will just redirect it. You will forward it. It's a it's a node in the middle, yeah. Cool, all right. If you have further questions, uh, we are still around here, so you can uh, just come to us and uh, ask, or ask in Slack, we will try to look there. And yeah, with that, uh, thanks a lot.